mark the 100th anniversary of Shannon Next. Uh, here and this year, the 200th anniversary of Bowl. Uh, at MIT, it's sponsored by uh, the Institute of Electronics, thank you, Yo, uh, Physics Department, uh, thank you, uh, Richard, and ECS, thank you, a bunch of people. Uh, and it's also co sponsored by the University of College Cork. Um, there will be other presentations throughout, uh, throughout this academic year, and uh, there will also be an event on March 18th, a one day event, so do look out for the announcements. Uh, I just want to make one very quick announcement, uh, modification. The reception is not going to occur at the 6th floor of Building 36. Instead, it's occurring at the 8th floor, and it's been upgraded from the usual coffee and cookies to, thank you, y'all, wine and cheese. So, <laughs> uh, so it's wonderful. So going on to today's talk, we're delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Madhu Sudan. Uh, he is the Gordon McKay professor at Harvard. Uh, he, he stole him from us. He, he used to be one of us, and then he uh, went to uh, uh, Microsoft and Search. Uh, he has numerous awards in information theory and applied mathematics, none of which he has put in his bio. Um, but uh, today, he is going to talk to us about the laws of communication of thoughts. Thank you, Mujib. Thank you, Muriel. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I must say, uh, this is a wonderful occasion to celebrate Boole and Shannon together. Uh, and this is, uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful in part because it forced me to go back and read stuff up about Boole. And you know, mostly we, we know a lot about Shannon and still you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to read that paper again. It's monumental. I, don't conf I confess that I never read the whole thing uh, together, but I keep reading bits and pieces, and every time I find something wonderful and surprising and uh, inspiring in there. Um, I do wonder why I was invited to give this talk here, so I tried to you know, put some pieces together from partly from my research, from my experience, and to say something which would say make, make plausible sense in this context. So my apologies if this doesn't fly well, but it's an, it's an attempt, and I hope you enjoy the bits and pieces, even if there's the overall picture is somewhat hanging. Now, when I started, uh, <clears throat> like much like most of you, probably this is as much as I knew about Boole. He invented the strange mathematics of zeros and ones. All right, um, and uh, so I actually went ahead and looked at uh, his book, which is, by the way, I mean one of the nice things about the modern era is every one of these old books is available online. Anything published. Uh, before 1922 is available copyright free and the Project Gutenberg is going around uh, <clears throat> converting many of the uh, wonderful books into digital format. So in a minute I had the book and I read it and it's wonderful mathematics really. So let me show you a typical calculation that comes from this thing. So he starts with this axiom in one of these, uh, uh, one of these pages. He says, look, when you're world dealing with the Boolean world, x times x is really equal to x. And what does he mean? He says, look, let me give you an illustration. If I tell you that an object is good and I tell you that the object is good, that's redundant. You know, you'd know it's just the same as saying the object is good. This is the exact example and phrases that are being used, though I'm inserting my own words inside somewhere. Now he goes on from this to say, okay, as a consequence, I'll obtain the principle of contradiction. Okay, what is the principle of contradiction? It is impossible for any being to possess a quality, and at the same time to not possess it. Okay, so yes, something obvious and so on, but still, this is a fact about nature, but it is not an independent one. It actually follows from the axiom above, and he starts deriving it. So how do you get it? Say, what we started off, we said x times x, x squared equals x, which can be rewritten as saying x times one minus x equals zero. And from this, you split this, you factor this, and you say, look, either x equal to 0, or the negation of x, which is what 1 minus x is, equals 0. So either x cannot happen, x equals 0, or negation of x cannot happen. So this is a consequence. And this wonderful you know, little nugget of mathematics already appears in page 34 in Boole's work. And it's actually wonderful to see at this time, at this age, he was doing this kind of work. 
really, really very pretty, very profound. What was his motivation, by the way? By the way, this is, appears in page 34 of this online text. So I can't help but remark that Boole was really going against the grain of mathematics. If you are doing mathematics and you want to be bigger, stronger, if you are weak, you do number theory dealing with the integers. You are stronger, you want to do optimization, at least the rationals, and of course, the more complex a mathematical structure you can produce, the more rich you are. So here you are, progress in mathematics goes up, and Boole goes down. Okay? He says, look, let's look at the set containing of two elements, and let's do mathematics over this set. How could this be particularly interesting or inspiring? Why did he do this? And now you read his ambition. Okay, by the way, this is a quote from the book. This is the first sentence. Now, if there are any graduate students in the audience, please do not take this as a recommendation for the length of a sentence. I prefer <laughs> roughly smaller sentences. But, you know, it's a, it's a profound sentence. This is the first sentence of the book. Okay? Let me highlight some things in here. He wants to understand how reasoning is performed, not in mathematics, not everywhere else, in the mind. This is you know, no holds barred analysis of the laws of thought. This is not logic, this is not philosophy. But he says that logic and probabilities, and I, you know, you've had a speaker already who's told you about this, but logic and probabilities are going to rest on the foundations that he's building. Okay? But the foundation is really interested in understanding the reasoning in the mind. And even more remarkably, he goes on to say, and based on this, he's going to draw some conclusions about the nature and constitution of the human mind. I mean, he's not just, I mean, this is neuroscience in the making, and this is 200 years back, roughly, give or take. Okay. His view of the world, the zero and one did not sit where, we, where I've drawn it here. It's really more like this. Okay? It's really a profound, vastly encompassing. This is not contained in the reals and in the intersection of all the previous exercises that mathematics has been uh, conducting. This is the union and the completion of all the mathematics that people have been conducting. It's remarkable, and it happened so long back. Okay? So fast forward a bit. We come to our second hero, Shannon. Shannon, I think we've, uh, looking at the faces around the room, at least half of you know him very, very well. And I won't tell you in great details what he did and what he did, uh, you know, what are his profound and seminal contributions. I'm just going to restrict myself to about a slide or two. But he is another hero for, for example, this sentence, okay? Somewhere in the second paragraph or something of this, uh, of his monumental work, The Mathematical Theory of Communication, he defines the problem of communication. This is a recommendation to all you graduate students out there. When you're doing something, define it. Even if you think everybody knows what we mean, let's define it. He says, the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point, exactly or approximately, the message selected at another point. That is the definition of the problem of communication. Now we can go along making ramifications, you know, instantiations, et cetera, et cetera, but this is a very nice, broad, general definition of what it is that we are trying to solve. It's wonderful to see this. I, you know, it may be obvious to everybody at this moment, but to abstract everything that we could possibly mean by communication, to distill one thing which actually encompasses all of that, it's, it's as profound as Boole on the previous page. He also has a very engineering-oriented mind, okay? So the second sentence that I've abstracted, which is from the, first para from the same paragraph, but Thorne tells you that he wants to lay out the specifications of what a solution to a communication system should look like. So on, I won't dwell on it, but engineering is the motivation. And yet, mathematics really emerges from this theory. Okay, I mean, there is profoundly beautiful mathematics, whether it's the concept of the information or the bit. By the way, Boole spoke about zeros and ones. Shannon's paper gives it the name. He calls it a binary digit and uh, cites Tukey for suggesting the abbreviated form bit, which has stuck with us since. So, you know, as far as names concerned, this is a profound contribution too. He measured information, he measured entropy, he told us what entropy was. 
the capacity of a channel, the rate of a source, everything that you can imagine, all these wonderful concepts were extracted in this one piece of work. And everything starts to emerge already on the first page. And you know, that's why I sort of stop after five or six pages. Um, but for those, for the math aficionados, by the way, there is this amazing thing just buried somewhere in the middle of this thing is the probabilistic method. The way you prove the existence of an object that you need is by picking one at random and saying, well, the random object is expected to satisfy this uh, um, condition with positive probability. I mean, uh, 1948, this is still a couple of years before the first works involving the probabilistic method, which became a central tool and technique in combinatorics of the 50s and 60s and 70s, and still is today. So these are wonderful things that came out of Shannon's work. But the thing that I want to emphasize today is also he, even this work, so engineering oriented, you know, it captures some natural phenomena. And I'll give you an illustration of this, and probably very familiar to many of you. He talked about the series of approximations to English in this paper. Okay? So he said, we can approximate to a natural language by means of a series of simple artificial languages. These languages are not going to be the characteristics, but uh, not the same thing. It's, these are simple mathematical models, but let's see how it works. What's the goal? Really no particular goal, curiosity. Okay. What could happen this way? So he defines a series of approximations, the ith of these series, the ith order approximation, says that the way we will generate a sentence in this language is by picking the first i minus 1 by some process. And you will see this process continues over time. And once the i minus 1 symbols have been chosen, the next one is chosen by looking at the conditional probability. If I look at texts in English, if the first three letters are A, R, E, then what are the various options for the fourth letter? That would be the fourth order approximation to English. 1948, well, I guess between 1944 and 48, while I was writing this paper, he had lots of time. So he actually did hand construct some random series that he could produce that way. For example, here is the third order letter approximation to English. And you see, OK, look, now many of these words are not really words. This is not the most profound English sentence that you might have read. But already there is a little bit more than you expect. And uh, then he also did, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to do it one letter at a time. You could do it one word at a time. And then he produced what he called the second order word approximation. This is as far as he went. And then you know, he basically ran out of patience, I guess. And, but look at this thing, the head and in frontal attack on an English writer that the character of this point is therefore another method for the letters that the time of whoever told the problem for an unexpected. You know, if you were in an average class that I'm teaching, and, you, know, you might actually think that that was a legitimate sentence. <laughs> Definitely fools us for a little while. So, and OK, so yeah, this is an interesting experiment. What do you do with it? Shannon actually has a wonderful uh, observation. How many people knew the ob know the observation that follows this? Anyone? There is actually a wonderful observation hanging at the end of all of this. He says, you know, it's remarkable that the i order approximation looks good for sentences of length, uh, for sequences of length 2i. You look at twice the length. I only picked, you know, the second word was picked, chose based on the first. But I could look at sequences of length about four, and they could be legitimate elements in an English sentence. It's pretty remarkable that there is something un interesting happening about English that is being captured by this very simple model and this very astute observation. It's not a theorem. It's just an observation, but it seems pretty reasonable and plausible. There's something interesting going on. So even Shannon couldn't resist you know, taking this innovation that he had produced and then applying it to some things which were not necessarily the problem, you know, central to the problem at hand, which was really compressing and making uh, communication resilient to errors. There are all these other ramifications. Once you start developing a theory, you could go in many directions. Between Boole and Shannon, there's a whole series of uh, thinkers that I'd really like to uh, mention. There's a few of them that I'll mention. And what's the point of this particular choice? I want to talk about this general goal 
that Boole was interested in, how can you reason about what's going on inside the mind? I want to expand it based on Shannon to say, how can we reason about what we do and what we say? And put together, I mean, this is starting to give us the elements of society. And lots of these logicians in the interim period started to wonder about this. Perhaps the most, uh, I don't have name tags over here for, for all of our uh, figures. I'll tell you who they are. Um, the first of these is Cantor. And Cantor basically put a big question mark on this uh, style of reasoning where we were hoping that there'd be you know, incredible uh, leaps and bounds by which we'll be able to understand mathematics because Boole has now formed a theory of what mathematics is all about, of reasoning is all about. But Cantor started to put something which looked like a question mark. Something about this theory is not on the same solid grounds that we think it was. We didn't quite understand what it was. So in fact, so much so that Hilbert, at the turn of the uh, 19, I mean, uh, at 1900 roughly, came up with a very firm exclamation saying, look, all of mathematics will be reasoned about logically, compactly, and we will figure out everything roughly in an automated way. And this is where the thing is. And he came up with this. This is the so-called Hilbert program of converting math into completely sound reasoning. Uh, unfortunately, Kurt Gödel noticed that there are problems, which basically went back to the work of Cantor, saying not all of logic can be encompassed by itself. You know, when you have a small subset of mathematics or reasoning, which actually encloses all of its, all of mathematics and reasoning, in particular itself, there's a little bit of a self-reference problem, and this self-reference problem leads to big problems, the diagonalization concept, which says you can't really reason about yourselves. And Gödel was the first to be able to formalize it completely. And then came you know, further uh, <coughs> um, versions of this. Um, Church and then Turing, and the two of them basically sort of said, it's not just a feature of how you express yourselves, what kinds of logic you want to work with. It really is an all-encompassing phenomenon. Turing was the first person in this lot to actually take logic back to the style of Boole, I think. I mean, really saying, look, you don't have to encode everything in terms of numbers and arithmetic and so on. Just working with or and and or and any other operation that you would care about is legitimate. All of these things, any of these things encompasses reasoning, and none of these is going to be consistent and complete. But there is a plus mark next to Turing. Why? Because as a byproduct, we invented the theory of computing. We invented the computer. We said, look, in order to be able to reason about things, to say that something is valid or sound reasoning, we have to talk about what is a reasonable step in the reasoning process. A reasonable step in the reasoning process is exactly what we consider as a reasonable step that a computer can take today. And uh, voila, comes out the model of the Turing machine, as we call it now, the model, the first model of a universal computer, something that can do any form of computing. So these wonderful philosophers in injected something and put together, they lead us to where we are today, where we can reason pretty significantly about what we can, you know, where we can speak fairly confidently about what we can reason about. It's not ever going to be all encompassing. Unfortunately, there's things out there which are forbidden, but we are going to get whatever can be encompassed will be captured by these theories. And so I want to tell you about a little bit about these things. So the broader picture that I want to talk about, reasoning and communication about reasoning, both of which are very important to us as a human society are all reducible to mathematics. Everything can be formalized and abstracted and talked about in mathematical terms. And uh, I mean, you know, and this is something that's inevitable. If we work in this field, if we work in the field of information, if we work in the field of communication, you have to, you know, at some point or the other, you do get connected to this broader picture. And because this is what we are doing, we are thinking, we are communicating. So we eventually have to go back to this thing. Even Shannon couldn't resist this. There's the very profound uh, uh, corollary to these works, which is the importance of the discrete world of mathematics, working with zeros and ones. Uh, Boole more or less sort of make, made that the starting point of all of work. Shannon actually went a step further in a very different paper. He actually talks about, you know, we could communicate 
by sending arbitrary real numbers on a wire and to each other, why is it that at the end we only want to talk, communicate in a sequence of bits? Somehow this is related to the fact that we want to be resilient to and tolerant to errors that might happen. We don't want tiny jitters in the communication to affect us. But the jump from going from this model to saying, look, we can only work with discrete things requires some analysis, and Shannon actually carried this out carefully. But it tells us that really the reasoning, all solid reasoning, sound reasoning rests on working with, you know, sentences that we can express over discrete alphabets. I mean, why don't we just sit around singing songs to each other and communicating that way or humming a tune or whistling? Some animals do do that, but when it comes to sufficiently expressive and complex communication, we actually seem to be forced to go to a discrete alphabet and work over it. So there's something very in interesting going on, and this is abstracted in these works. And I'd like to talk about what's called the communication lens that I think about. It's not so important to me that the reasoning inside my mind happened over a discrete alphabet or through a very you know, computer, you know, Turing machine simulatable concept. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But at the end, the only way I can convince you about the outcomes of anything that I've learned is by communicating it. And at that stage, more or less, the only way I have to express and communicate what I'm doing is by simulating the Turing machines, the Boolean logic, and uh, <clears throat> doing a noise tolerant communication a la Shannon. So the communication lens on what's going on in our mind is probably much more important to me than really what's going on in my mind. I'm very happy to say, look, you could do all kinds of very weird things inside your mind as long as you can communicate what you, your findings are and publish a paper based on that. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to do a couple of things. One, I'll tell you a little bit about computer scientists and their adventures in this field, where they try to think about all the, I mean, these are questions that we explored because, again, there were pressing engineering concerns, pressing optimization concerns, pressing other concerns. But along the way, they always seem to have a ramification which is interesting for you know, the general process of society. And I'll try to tell you a little bit about some of these processes. And then later, depending on the amount of available time, I'll tell you a little bit about my worries about the world of communication as it is and where we are going. And it is about the communication of thought. When we really want to think about shipping bits around, there's a lot more we can do. But when we try to say that, well, these bits mean something to me, and I want this meaning also to be preserved, uh, then we have to encounter, uh, we, we encounter and face new problems that we wish to solve, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Okay. So let's see how far we go along. It took 50% to get one third of the talk. Um, we'll see if we can speed up a bit. All right, so uh, between 1950s, Shannon, and today, there are a couple of axioms, the discrete communication, the discrete reasoning that we've talked about. There was a new axiom that was born around this period, which is when we talk about computing, we shouldn't be talk about what can be done in finite time or not. We should also talk about what's a reasonable amount of time. Finite could be a very, very, very large finite, but we want to talk about something reasonable. So notions such as polynomial time, or logarithmic amount of space and so on started to emerge around this period. And these became a new category of resources. When we want to talk about reasonable processes that are happening in our mind, we should also make sure that you're not asked to be a genius at every step of the uh, reasoning. And these led to many interesting phenomena being captured. This, the modern era of cryptography relies on it. And a couple of examples that I'll talk about, like pseudorandomness and knowledge, emerged from this thing. And uh, m uh, there's a lot of work today about what is privacy and so on. And all of these can actually be formalized. We think of these as really just societal concepts, something that we cannot convert into mathematics till it is done. And now, in, for each one of these cases, it has been done. And we now know what, or we have a pretty reasonable grip on these uh, concepts and are able to analyze them and put them under the same mathematical umbrella that Shannon and Boole did with their phenomena. So pseudo-randomness, what could we mean by this? So here's the sequence. Is the sequence random? Okay, I have some 11 digits on the screen. Did I just come up with them at random or not? Okay. And there's an answer which 
many people come up and they say, no, 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 finite sequence is random, you know. <clears throat> you can't say that any particular sequence is random. I don't want to work with that. I mean, that's like by fiat going to destroy every example I put, even after I toss, you know, 10 coins in front of you, you would probably say that's not random. So this is a more compelling uh, dismissal of the claim that that was random. These are actually, if you go to the digits of pi and you can get your first 10,000 online and so on, these are actually the digits 9758 onwards down to 9768. Okay? These are the digits of pi, certainly not random. Okay? And yet it did seem random to me. Okay? So how do you explain this? And this is a kind of a phenomenon that has confounded many of us for long times. And I want to tell you about the mathematical explanation that has been found for this thing due to Blum and Macaulay. And roughly it says the following, how do you know the statement, you know, that this is, you know, suppose told you, somebody told you, look, these are just some substring in the digits of pi. How would you go around finding this out? The only way I know is you start enumerating the digits of pi. Even if somebody gives it to me, a table of values, you know, which this is exactly how I found the digits of pi, I just looked it up online. Even if I have this online access to the digits of pi, the only way I have of figuring it out is to go manually search for this pattern until I find it. That takes me some 9,768 steps of reasoning. It's 11 digit string. It takes me 9,768 steps, and if, it, if I'd been you know, a little bit more malicious, I would have gone, you know, there's a million digits available, I can go up to you know, a millionth, I can make you work for a million units of time to figure out that this 11 digit sequence is not random, okay? But what would have been reasonable is if I could have you know, looked at the sequence, looked at the length of the sequence, and based on the length of the sequence, you know, maybe 11 operations or 11 squared operations or 11 cubed operations, and determined that this number satisfies some pattern. If I could have done that, I would have definitely dismissed this. If this had been a sequence of all zeros, everybody in this room would have said that's not random. Why? Because we very quickly detected a pattern, and that pattern is good. But it's very important that there is a pattern. Here also there's a very simple pattern. This is just the 9758 to 9768 digits of pi. It's a very, very small description of this 11 digit sequence. But it took me time which was related to <clears throat> you know, how complex the pattern was. It was how far down in this pi sequence I was working with, not as long as the sequence was. And Blum and Mikali said, well, that is really pseudo-randomness. If it looks random to me, then it is random to us. So this is one of these wonderful explanations of a phenomenon that we try to grapple with. We look at you know, the stock market, is this moving randomly, or is there somebody trying to tamper with it and trying to move this particular stock in a given direction? I mean, you know, it's very hard to tell these things, and these, the theory of pseudo-randomness can formally explain to us why it's so hard for us to reason about these things. It's, sometimes it's not because there's no short pattern, it's because that short pattern is there, but it's hard to find. So randomness really lies in the mind of the beholder, and that's something that can be formalized and made completely mathematical using the axioms of Shannon, Boole, and the theory of computing. Uh, aside within the randomness thing is this concept called distinguishability, this notion of what, does thing, what do things look like to an external observer? And it's a very important theme which is emerging in computer science. It's a very, very, very powerful tool, and I want to tell you a little bit about it. This is going to be a little technical as a slide, but bear with me. Already in Shannon's work, the communication theory of secrecy systems, which is where he started to build the theory of cryptography, he started looking at random variables and say, well, how can you tell if they are equal or not? Equal was not very important. It said, well, two things are equal if for every test they give you the same value. But this can only happen if the two random variables have exactly the same distribution. But if for every test the expected value of this test is more or less the same, then these things are close. And they're computationally undistinguishable. Inside this box, there's some process that's going on. I cannot tell whether it's, you know, <clears throat> created by an intelligent being or a computer because the 
uh, for, to an external observer, they look more or less the same. This was a concept of distinguishability or indistinguishability. If things are not really very discernibly different, then we should think of them as being the same. This notion really got a significant boost due to the work of Goldwasser and Michali, which in turn led to the concept of pseudo-randomness in the previous slide, where they talk about computational indistinguishability. When we talk about distinguishability, we say, how well can a test distinguish two different events? You know, maybe these sequence of medical experiments, we gave a placebo to somebody. In this other sequence, we gave a, um, the latest favorite drug. We want to distinguish between them. We want to say, let's run all possible tests. But really, not all possible tests may be relevant to the case. And depending on the notion of the resource that you're willing to invest in your test, maybe a much smaller subclass is all that's important. In computer science, it's very useful for us to think about tests that run efficiently in polynomial amount of time. In other settings, you could have other notions. Any of these, for any of your favorite class of tests over here, you can sort of define a notion of, are these two events really different? The A-B testing, are they really distinguishable or not relative to this class of tests? And when you start relativizing distinguishability to a class of tests, you get this really, really rich collection of um, plausible notions. And many, many more things start to appear seemingly random. If B is purely random process, and A is something that's cooked up by some very clever process, the two of them could look indistinguishable to us. Maybe A is just the digits of pi. Well, they could look indistinguishable to us if I don't apply a sufficiently sophisticated test. And these kinds of processes can be explained over here. A second philosophy, uh, concept that, became, that got abstracted in the uh, recent works is the concept called knowledge. And uh, I want to distinguish over here the concept of information from the concept of knowledge. Now, you know, you can have sequences which contain a lot of information measured in bits, They're just long. I mean, my email every day you know, just keeps pouring and pouring and pouring, and, and all I have to do with it is get rid of it. Um, but there's very little knowledge associated with it. We have an informal understanding of what this means. What does it mean formally? And this is a concept that I will not define carefully today, but I'll just want to tell you a little bit. We always think, OK, so if I get you know, a packet of n bits, maybe the amount of knowledge over there is upper bounded by the amount of information. But even that is not true. I mean, if I send you a sequence of zeros, there's no information there. And there's no knowledge there. But I could send you other sequences which have zero information, but actually contain knowledge. If I tell you the password to my bank, or look at, I mean, look at your, your traffic, what you're typing, and what you're sending over your internet protocols to when you log into your bank account. You are typing your password, but it doesn't get transmitted as your password in the wires, or else your internet provider, anybody sniffing the wireless at your home, will all have it. We don't have it. So telling them the password actually has zero information, though. Why? Because the sequence that you you're sending is completely, the sequence that you're sending completely determines your password. There is only one password which could have led to the sequence that you're actually transmitting on your wires. But the knowledge of what your password is is not there yet. So when you're inter if you go to your internet pro service provider or someone who's sniffing your, the wireless at your home, you tell them what your password is, you're conveying the knowledge to them, but there's no information there. They could have, you know, as soon as you give them the sequence, they can sort of check and say, oh yeah, I knew that, because this one is the one that encrypts to the stuff that you were actually sending out there. So knowledge is something which is very different. It can be more than the amount of information. It can be less than the amount of information. What, how do you quantify it? How do you reason it? And, and I really care about this particular question, because this, I think, really starts to tie in to this concept of how do we preserve the knowledge that we are generating. So Goldwasser, Mikali, and Rakoff came up with what I would call the axioms of knowledge. They were a very formal, precise mathematical definition. I'm just not giving it today. But some of the concepts that they talk about are very interesting. Knowledge is something that has to be provably useful. I mean, so stated another way, you should be willing to pay for it. Okay? 
This is the kind of, I mean, it's not just bits, it's bits that I'd be willing to pay for. And just like anything else that you'd be willing to pay for, you should actually, you know, you should be able to verify the utility. It's no use, you know, I come to you and say, look, here is a collection of bits which will tell you exactly what the stock price of IBM is going to be in three years from now. Give me a million dollars. Well, you know, if I'm right, it's worth it, but you wouldn't be ready to part with that money today based on that. So you should really be able to verify the utility. And when you verify the utility, then you consider it knowledge. Okay? So you shouldn't just pay for, you know, I could just give you random bits and say this is really relevant to you, but you should really be able to measure the utility yourselves. And these two are really important axioms, and around these axioms, Goldwasser, Mikhali, and Rakoff were able to formalize the concept of knowledge. It was an extremely profound concept and had very powerful, you could actually do a lot. I mean, so uh, one of the things that they try to talk about is what's called zero knowledge interactions, where I would like to be able to convince, say, as an internet user, I want to be able to convince the bank that I should be allowed to move funds from my bank account to the other. I want to convince them that I am the person who's allowed to use this account. How do I define, I am the person, I am the one who has the password. But I don't want to tell you what the password is. Everybody on the path from here to there is going to find out what the password is. So I want to be able to convince you that I know the password, but no more. I don't want to say anything more, no more knowledge about my password other than the fact that I know it. Can you actually do this? Goldwasser, uh, Goldreich, Mikhali, and Vigdeson. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> in work that shortly followed the work of Goldwasser, Mikhali, and Rakoff, showed that actually every possible interaction that you want to imagine, if you have a sound way of doing it, then you should also be able to do it cryptographically securely with leaking exactly the right amount of information at every one of these stages. So if I want to tell somebody this, I know the password, I can do it, and nothing more about the password will be revealed. So I can do the same thing again tomorrow. I still can come back to you and I still convince you that I know the password. And again, no more further information. Doesn't accumulate, doesn't do anything. Fantastic thing. So of course this uh, theorem, which is very general and very powerful, has many profound applications. So here were some applications that you can find in pop science articles. So for example, the second of these, where is Waldo? What is that? You know, Waldo is this game where there are, you know, ton of people in their faces on a little piece of image. You want to convince your child that, uh, look, you know, this is an interesting exercise. Go find Waldo in this thing. You know, keeps them occupied. Well, five minutes later, the child gives up and says, look, there's no Waldo on this page. Okay. Now you want to tell them, look, Waldo is there. Okay. You want to prove it to them. But you don't want to ruin the puzzle by saying, right here, now go find Waldo, <laughs> right there. So you have to do something which is different and actually not entirely using the principles of this idea, but some of the essential ideas of zero knowledge, people can actually came up with this protocol where which you could actually show, convince the child that Waldo exists on this board using you know, intelligence that, you know, not super complicated intelligence, just reasoning that a child could perform, and yet the puzzles, un, you know, un, uh, um, undiminished by this process, and it remains as challenging. So that's the kind of a fun application that's shown, but the real main application was any form of multi-party computation on the internet can all pretty much be, almost by routine, uh, by this process converted into a secure one. So any process, what do I mean by that? Some process by which you sort of think of sending all, all of us sit around a table, send all of our private information to some trusted third party, and this trusted third party sends us back some information for each one of us, which depends on our joint inputs. This is, would be my ideal scheme, but there's no trusted third party. You can implement this by simple cryptographic primitives, and all of this builds on the concept of zero knowledge. You don't have to have this trusted third party. You can do all of this using simple cryptography, and all of this relies on knowledge. Okay. So, that's as much of the CS. There were many, many wonderful adventures in computer science. There is a theory of learning, which many of you are probably familiar with. There is the notion of privacy. There are notions hanging around what is secrecy, you know, going back to Shannon and subsequently. Uh, many of these profound concepts can actually be what is awareness, what is fairness, 
they can all be formalized. And in fact, I mean, I think one of our goals in the field of information could be to just pick up a book in anthropology or sociology and look at a single sentence and try to say, how do you convert this sentence into mathematics? You know, what are they trying to say? You should be able to convert it. It's, it's, not, it's not a given. There are very interesting uh, uh, um, <clears throat> realizations that we could come up with by this process. It's also uh, 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 not always going to be very easy to do. There are, I mean, I often find that I, I, I used to work with a bunch of uh, sociologists when I was at Microsoft Research. And you know, the, the words privacy for them means five different things, and they really have to unpack what it means in a given context. So for us who are unfamiliar, we can't just go into this thing and say, this is the one unique interpretation of the sentence. But find me one interpretation of a sentence, and this can be very fun. So moving on to the final elements of my uh, exercise, I want to talk a little bit about the communication of thought. I just, you know, when, when Muriel came up with this invitation and said, look, let's talk about Boole and Shannon, and said, look, there's communication, there's thought. There should be something we can do to glue these things together. And this is roughly what I thought about. It's something that I do think about a lot, but maybe not in the same terms as I'm going to describe today. But I do want to think about this. Communication in society, I'm no longer talking about uh, communication between uh, two devices or something like that. It's a network phenomenon. There is a lot of very interesting things that happen. But no one element, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But I want to talk about um, <clears throat> the intellectual pursuit that sort of relies, that society sort of relies on, which starts with some existing body of knowledge. So all the stuff that we already have published in papers today is some existing body of knowledge. We go around, we read some of these things, we learn from them, we find some new discoveries, and we write about them. And uh, this process keeps getting repeated. This is roughly what intellectual pursuit is. I want to ask questions as a communication theorist, which are sort of the, some of the most natural questions about these things. You know, what is the error correction mechanism? Okay, I mean, uh, maybe there isn't one. I mean, we're all talking about there is a world out there, I think, which talks about. Uh, uh, flatland, uh, global cooling, and uh, I don't know, uh, intelligent design, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, there is probably, um, <clears throat> so, so certainly some schools of thought persist, even which, you know, which some of us would consider completely wrong. Uh, but there probably is some error correction mechanism to communication of knowledge. If I just keep using the existing bodies of knowledge and relying on them, at some point an error creeps in. Will it just propagate and kill everything else in the future, all future discoveries? Or is there something that's going on to wrap things around and bring us back? The second thing that I do want to think about is, how, so how are we communicating this knowledge? I mean, it's one thing to say, look, here is, um, you know, here is a sequence of, uh, here is a set of messages from which I want to pick one. I want to tell you which one it is. We both agreed on the set, and we've both agreed on um, what is the ordering of elements in the set and how each one would be encoded. Now I want to send you one. That's somewhat easier. A much more challenging question is you know, if these things are actually getting evol evolving. And that's really what happens. And now you start encountering uh, phenomena like languages or dictionaries and journals. These are all being designed in by society to communicate knowledge. And what are the axioms and what are the uh, consequences that, uh, what kinds of uh, properties do these have? So I'm interested in these two questions, and I'll tell you a little bit about my own personal views about both. The error correction mechanism, I think, at least if you think about the communication of mathematical knowledge, it is uh, via proofs. So it doesn't matter how you arrive at some new piece of knowledge. I mean, you could cook it up, you could read all kinds of theorems, many of them might be false, as long as you come up with a theorem that you can prove. And that proof at the end is a, you know, it doesn't matter, nobody asks you how you manage to come up with this, where you are on LSD, it doesn't matter. But you must provide a self-contained proof of this new piece. That's, and as long as you can do that, you are doing some error correction and tolerance. So it's a very sound approach. A question to ask is, is it slowing us down? If, we are you know, if you were trained like a physicist, you would probably abandon the self-contained proof notion and work with some other 
uh, mechanisms and etc. So two concrete things that happen over here is the verification is actually time consuming. Who wants to sit around verifying a long and drawn out proof of things that seem to be you know, obvious? And uh, the other thing is that the proofs are actually long. You know, you come up with this thing, so proofs are actually inordinately wrong. So these are things that are slowing us down. Should do we really need to work with this thing? So it turns out that the computer scientists have been adventuring with the notion of proofs for a very long time. Uh, it relates to computing. This is why Turing came up with the notion of uh, a Turing machine to understand what is a proof and what makes it. What is the definition of easy in easy to verify? Um, it relates to cryptography. This is how you say, you know, users convince somebody else that they have the right to use the system, they have a right to make a transaction. They send proofs in their own way. It relates also to optimization somehow. I mean, one of the underlying observations in the theory of computing is proofs are hard to find. It's a barrier. And the simpler you make your proof system, the harder the barrier becomes. Even simpler problems become harder to solve. Become hard to, uh, you know, it becomes clear that they're hard to solve. So these have been very central elements in theory of computing. And so it's very natural that when it came to proofs, we started exploring with the concept, saying, well, we know the traditional way of doing proofs, but let's try some variations. One variation goes back to the same work of Golba, Samikali, and Rakoff, and also by Babai, is the notion of an interactive proof. I don't have to, proofs don't have to be strings that are written down on a piece of paper and read, you know, so frozen in time. They could also be interactive in nature, right? Send you some information, you ask me questions. These are reasonable notions of proofs as well, and can you do anything interesting? So can you use the power of bidirectional communication, you to me and me to you? to improve the efficiency of the verification. Verification, we understand, is onerous and burdensome. Can it be made easier? And it turns out, of course, I mean, you know, we've all been, uh, uh, you know, the Pepsi versus Coke interactive test. You know, you ask, you give me a sample, and you do a blind taste test. If I can tell the difference, then they're probably different. That's a proof that Pepsi is not the same as Coke if it works. And if it doesn't work, then it's, so you can prove some things in very, very simple ways. And this can be converted into nice mathematical analogies like graph isomorphism, non-isomorphism can be proved, et cetera. But a very profound result over here is you can actually do the following exercise. I can give you this statement as if go find me a short proof, okay? <clears throat> you go along, you think about it for ages and ages and ages. You didn't manage to find a short proof. How do you come back and convince me that the reason it didn't work is because a short proof does not exist, as opposed to you didn't you were being lazy and you didn't look for one. Okay. Well, you could say, look, go try out all proofs which are you know ten pages long. There is none. I cannot enumerate all pages that are ten pages long. You can produce for me a list of all ten page long sequences and say, see, none of these is a proof. That's not very useful either. It's again enormously wrong. Is there something you can do? And there is a, the theory of interactive proofs. There is this wonderful result which says that this kind of a statement can actually be proved interactively. You can, <clears throat> I would ask you some challenging questions. You know, each question may be about 10 pages long. You give me back answers which are 10 pages long. You know, 10 iterations later, I'd be convinced, okay, there was really no proof which was 10 pages long for the statement. This can actually be done. It's a beautiful theorem uh, due to Lund, Fortno, Karloff, and Nissan, and then Shamir. And uh, I encourage you to take a look at it at some point. The, the object that's closest to my heart over here is that of probabilistically checkable proofs, where we just say, OK, the proof is going to be long. We're not going to fix that problem. But at least the verification doesn't have to go through the whole proof and read the whole thing. You just try to verify by random sampling. And here it turns out, and this is some theorem that we proved and then was strengthened by Hostad later, which is a really remarkable statement from once you see the Hostad version of it. There is a format in which you can write proofs, not the usual format that you are used to, but there is a format in which you can actually just read three bits of the proof. Doesn't matter what's the statement, doesn't matter what's the complexity of the, uh, of the verifier who came up with the proof, et cetera, et cetera, of the prover who came up with the proof. You just have to read three bits of the proof. These are not 
deterministically chosen. These are randomly chosen. So you have a strategy by which you'll read some three bits. And the three bits are not read independently of each other. Very unlikely that that will do anything good for you. You read them sort of correlatedly, but randomly. The first location will be probably random. Second one is slightly random given the first. Third one completely determined, but you read the three of them. Then you do some very simple tests. In fact, the simple, simplest test is about half the time you check to see if the parity of these things is zero, and the other half you check to see if the parity is one. That's it. This actually is a legitimate verification mechanism for any proof. And uh, <clears throat> you will only accept proof, valid proofs of valid statements. And if you give me an invalid theorem for which there's no proof, nothing will convince me with probability more than 50%. Okay. That's uh, the statement in this arena, which says at least you know, the verification task is really uh, dismissible. Couple of, you know, there are many, many versions of these results. Some recent ones like uh, Dinur in 06 and Moshkovitz and Raz in 2008 actually give you very, very reasonable. You know, these proofs are a little bit longer than what you would traditionally work with, but not much more. It's not even a quadratic blow up. It's much, much, much smaller. <clears throat> and if you don't like the idea of these long proofs, Silvio uh, Michali over here with Killian and others have actually come up with this concept by which you can even make the length of the proof much shorter. These are called computationally sound proofs. It's roughly, you don't give me the full long proof, but some fingerprint of it. And that fingerprint actually retains the property of being checkable. Okay, so it's a, it's a very clever construction. These are unfortunately proofs in courts because uh, proofs of incorrect statements do exist but they'd be really, really, really hard to come up with. So <clears throat> you can sort of, at least in the non-malicious setting, you can really be very happy with the proofs that exist as it is. When you combine this thing with something that Paul Valian did while I was a graduate student at MIT, uh, you get these things of, you know, really the kinds of things that you'd like to use when you want to preserve communication of thought. Every time you publish a paper, you write down a short certificate saying, here is the self-contained proof. Not the proof, but the computationally sound version of which it is very, very, very short, and anybody can verify very easily. And the next time somebody comes along and wants to publish a paper, they go use the two old little proofs. Uh, you know, I combine these two results to get a new one. I get my new result, I state it. I publish a signature of my proof, a fingerprint of my proof, which uses the previous two things, but it's not twice as long. It's actually as long as any of the previous ones. And you can just continue this process further. So these are really beautiful results, <clears throat> incredibly nice. And they keep, you know, there are many, many, many other notions that computer scientists have been exploring. But do they solve the problem? And this is something that I often get quizzed about. So we have these wonderful proofs. How many mathematical proofs are written in the PCP framework? Actually, none. But <clears throat> the reason people usually come up for this is that, you know, people don't really look to proofs for the proofs. They want to look, get understanding from the proofs. If that's the game, then you know, we are out of it. I don't know if you haven't formalized understanding well. We can't convey it. But even if you look at just the concept of verifiability, mathematics proofs are never self-contained. I mean, let me sort of say this again. Never. I'm not saying rarely. I'm not saying almost never. I'm saying never, period, OK? It's a mistake to think that anything can be self-contained. But things can be very moderately self-contained. And even that's not happening. But by the way, I mean, I, I just want to sort of mention the following thing. I mean, I just saw this book very recently. I, I remember this quote, and I went back, and I checked, yes, that book has that quote. And if you want it over wine and cheese, I'll tell you about the name of the book and who, what, the, what the page numbers are. Starts off with a statement at some the middle of the book somewhere and says, we give an elementary self-contained, elementary and self-contained proof of blah, blah theorem. Really wonderful. I really want this elementary self-contained proof. I want to teach it in my course. And then two sentences earlier, it had actually said, we assume the reader is familiar with the following reference. That reference is 60 pages <laughs> of notation. So that's the notion of self-containment that you know that you find, but even you know, and this is not the thing that I com I'm complaining about. Even to state a theorem, we have to assume a language, and the language is an unboundedly large object. 
Okay? There is no limits to, no a priori limit that I can write down saying this is how the language is. So unfortunately, this is a big obstacle. It's also, even if you say, look, you know, yes, but let's try to start with the sort of a Bourbaki-like assumption that there's a finite subset of the language, which is all I will rely on. Everything else <clears throat> I will try to give, describe to you in a self-contained manner, that would work. But that ends up in theorem statements which are incredibly long and complicated, and nobody now wants to read it. I mean, I don't know. I have some of these volumes. I never read it. It turns out to be enormous, and so that's a big problem. So <clears throat> most effective communication actually relies on the fact that the context is shared, and even if it is imperfect. I won't have time to talk about what one can do about these things, but this is something that we've been laboring a lot about. There is some work that I've been doing about this unbounded language problem, but I won't talk about it. And some work that we've been doing about the communication with very, very large context problem. Each one of these leads to remarkable, you know, interesting mathematical challenges. And yet I see that every time we manage to answer a question, we open up 10 other questions. So there is also lots of beautiful challenges. For students in this audience, I'll at least point them, you know, look at this page number 24, go to this uh, talk out uh, slides that I will post online. There is a very concrete question that's listed here. There are some references, and if you look them up, you'll find more details, and I encourage you to think about these questions and tell me if you have any ideas. Um, <clears throat> so, Overall, where I would like to go with this uh, entire line of work is I think we need to have a broader investigation of communication. Shannon's theory is wonderful, but it's wonderful way beyond the limits. He didn't a priori set out limits for this is as much as we want to do, but he sort of suggested it. He says, look, semantics is a separate problem and we will dismiss it. It's not interesting to the engineering considerations. It is engineering, in, important to the engineering considerations today. But fortunately, the theory is still very relevant. So you can ask many of the questions related to more broader forms of communication, even today in the Shannon language. And uh, one of the th very interesting things about communication, as it happens between human beings, but also increasingly as it's happening behind devices, is that there is no one central player making all the rules. Each one of these devices comes in and throws in its own little interruption onto the sequence, its own variation, and the rules of communication evolve. How do you study these things? What are the challenges? What are some paradigms we can see? How do you work with this? So, and the important thing over here is that, you know, at the end, why are we doing all of this? It's not because I want to prevent you from getting some information. It's to make it easier for you. It's usually a cooperative game. We're all in it together, and yet, we don't want to adhere to a single language. We don't want to adhere to a single protocol. We don't want to commit to a fixed set of rules in the grammar. And the same kinds of phenomena are happening when digital communication. This is all calling for a broader investigation of communication, and I think it would be lovely if many of us could take part in it. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Muriel. So, where do you put Galois in that series of people? Oh, Galois, uh, that's a great uh, question. So, um, somehow, I mean, I didn't think of Galois as somehow formalizing uh, the limits of logic or reasoning. The, his theory and his uh, impossibility of proving something within a particular thing certainly fits the framework. It's an interesting question. I maybe it should be yeah. One should maybe I should go back and reread re uh, uh, the, uh, the his theory about uh, uh, solvability of equations. Right. Yep. Great point. Yep. Mehran. As a physicist, I'm interested in how nature communicates with us. You said that the communication between humans is discrete. Is nature communicating with us discrete? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So uh, I haven't thought about it. Uh, so the question was, is nature communicating with us discreetly? 
humans are, or maybe are. I, I don't even know for a fact that humans are, but most of what we are communicating, we can sort of write it down and we can say, look, this is what's happening. I would say, even if nature is communicating with us in a continuous form, all the knowledge that we've got from it, we can probably write down on a piece of paper. And so at the end, the net summary is, ends up being discrete. And this is probably one of the profound observations from Shannon that you can communicate as, you know, in as complex and sophisticated ways as you want, but if the learner does not have the, if the channel does not have the ability and the learner does not have the ability to absorb it all, we are now limited. So uh, it is conceivable, however, that as we explore more and more and more of nature, we will learn more and more and more from it. And certainly that will happen. It will still not be, I doubt there will be this sort of moment of realization where we go from a quantum leap from finite amount accumulated so far to an unbounded amount. So my guess is, yeah, I mean, it may be a limitation of our own ability. So, so I really think, I mean, the communication lens would say, maybe it's sending many more bits per unit of time than we are able to absorb, but this is all we are able to absorb, so that's all it's, it's able to communicate. Pablo? So I cannot answer your objections to, or no objections to your critics, or criticism perhaps so I can move them into uh, some of the uh, PCB type things for the uh, action. I mean, there's been a lot of efforts in condensation of fragments and mathematics, right? I mean, do you actually see the possibility of using this, I mean, like our work, classification of finite groups, right? That's a case where we would not to actually believe that group. Okay, great. So, so, so the question was, can we, Imagine the theory of probabilistically checkable proofs or something like that actually being implemented in some concrete setting. Uh, and an example was the, say, the classification of finite simple groups, where I, I would say maybe, uh, maybe a little bit harder because the theorem statement gets pretty long. Uh, but the four color theorem or the sphere packing uh, things, they're all wonderful examples where the proofs that we were able to generate came from computers. But even in these cases, if you actually go back to you know, unpacking what else is happening, there is a lot. That being said, there are definitely a lot of mathematicians, in particular uh, Wojewodzki out of IAS, is trying to uh, do a, you know, f convert a lot of the math that he's doing into automated verifiable kind of proofs. And in any of these cases, it's conceivable that we might want to use the PCP-like <coughs> excuse me, structures to make verification interesting. Uh, and I, I would also say I can, there's a different direction in which people try to make this interesting. Uh, this was, uh, what's the, Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin has these tomes and tomes and tomes of information out there which is saying who registered what finding and who knows what, et cetera, et cetera. All the knowledge of the Bitcoin universe about who has how much money and so on is this huge online format, and it requires periodic checking and consistency checking to say, is my information consistent with yours? No one person actually owns everything, and we have to do consistency checks, and these have to be done fast. There's actually a proposal, one of my former collaborators is actually out there forming a company trying to do the verification via the PCP style, and making it very efficient. So it has gone into some elements of practice, but I would say it's not going to become the, you know, the, end, the ultimate solution to verification because much more mathematics is done which is outside this umbrella than inside. Very small amounts of things are so formal and precise that we can actually hope to give a formal complete proof of it. And the few examples that we came up with are probably the ones. Actually, I'd love to ask the same question to others too, but uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, I know there are proofs, we, we would love to run proofs which are sound, even if the provers, I mean, there are many instances where we run a cryptographic scheme and we say, look, as long as these two people who are well separated in time are not able to communicate with each other any faster than they can communicate through me, maybe this is sound, so as long as they're not communicating. 
But what if they carry some entangled information? Well, you know, they can get some correlated random bits faster than the speed of light. Can you design proofs which are using the solidity of you know, the separation of the provers, but um, you know, allow them to have prior entanglement? These are kinds of questions that are asked in this literature. I'm not an expert. I mean, there's just many, many, many variations on the themes, and I keep reading paper, keep seeing papers about this, but I don't know all of about it. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, one of the things I've been wondering about is how some of these things change in the age of machine learning. Like you talk about communication with journals and books and so on. If knowledge is generated by machine learning, what does the next generation of books look like? And I'm wondering if right. I mean, the end of the question. <coughs> yeah, I mean, the next generation of readers are all going to be the bots that are sitting out there and reading these things. And no, I think uh, we're definitely uh, entering this era where there's more and more and more communication that's you know, the more and more of our mental processes that we are offloading onto our digital uh, um, avatars or whatever. You know, your phone does a lot of calculations for you today. It can do a lot of timekeeping and calendar and scheduling for you today. Maybe tomorrow it'll book appointments, and day after tomorrow it'll book flights and so on and so forth. So for a lot of these things, on the one hand, we see that the possibility of what the little device can do is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I mean, it's really getting more and more powerful at taking all the information once it's packaged right and inferring new things and deducing things from that. The place where we are failing very miserably is when these things try to come together and try to interact with each other. So I think as we enter more and more the world of machine learning, we're going to see much more capability in the devices and much more possibilities of failures across devices, because when they're trying to communicate, then they don't seem to be able to synchronize. So um, I think, if anything, these kinds of questions will become even more pressing in, in the days to come. Uh, my ideal solution to a communication problem would be to reduce it to a learning problem. Okay? If I can abstract the communication well enough that I can now say, look, now it looks like the familiar good old learning problem. I consider it a done deal. That's uh, some of the many big challenges out here in terms of uh, how to make progress. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all.